Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you again, and thanks for tuning in. It was so good to see everybody on Wednesday night at the Bible study on Zoom. Uh, I just love seeing your happy faces and hearing your voices. I know it's been a really long time since we've been together uh, to worship and study at the church building, but it seems like it's going to be a few more weeks before we can slowly reopen the church building. And so I have some good news for you. Next Sunday, May 31st, we're going to live stream the Bible study and the whole church service from the church building on YouTube. So I hope that you'll tune in for that and, and join in with us. You know, I, I want to encourage you to just keep uh, staying connected with one another. This has been some tough times and uh, just keep calling each other and sending cards and and more than anything be praying for each other uh, i know my wife tries to keep up the the prayer list and send send out uh new prayer requests via email so i hope that you'll continue to pray for these people also i want to add chris olson to that prayer list uh, he's a friend of mine uh, a brother who used to attend in encinitas and uh, he's just had a really rough year this year. He's in the hospital right now. And so please pray for Chris Olson too. Last week, we started a new Bible study series on drawing near to God. And I really can't think of a more important subject to be studying right now than that. We're living in some really difficult times where people are scared and uh, frustrated, confused, and angry, and more than anything, we need God's help right now, and we need to draw near to Him. And the Bible just full of of encouragement to to draw near to God, and especially in the book of Hebrews, we looked at three passages last week that tell us to draw near to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and find help in our time of need. And we looked at another passage that said, draw near to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that that this great privilege that we have uh, is only available to Christians because of what Jesus has done for us and, and what he continues to do for us, interceding and speaking to God on our behalf. And then we, we looked at uh, the last one, draw near to God with full assurance of faith and how important it is that we, when we come to God, that we trust him completely. But when we come, we're to come on his terms. And James 4 verse 8 and following talk about how we are to be submissive and submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and, and the importance of really yielding our will to God's will and trusting him completely and obeying him wholeheartedly goes on to say with clean hands and the idea there is to be done with sin completely you know wash your hands of it and change the way you think about it and and repent and then he goes on to say with a pure heart and the idea there is that we are to purge all the sin from our hearts uh, colossians 3 talks about putting to death the sins of the sinful nature and, and ridding ourselves of all such things as these. And finally, he tells us to humble ourselves before God and he will lift us up. You know, humility is the opposite of pride. And the Bible says that God opposes the proud. And that doesn't mean that he just ignores them or rejects them. That word means that he sets himself up against them. And yet, he gives grace to the humble. And so we must approach God with true humility. This morning, I want to build on last week's sermon and talk to you about waiting on the Lord. You know, waiting is really not one of my strong suits. I think that most of us hate to wait. Ever been to the dentist or the doctor's office and you you arrive five minutes before your appointment and you check in and you sit down and then your name doesn't get called for 45 minutes drives me nuts 
or you go to the store to buy something and you you're standing in line waiting to pay for your groceries and the person in front of you instead of loading their groceries onto the conveyor belt is talking to the cashier about something they saw on TV I just can't stand it you know when I want something I want it now and sadly that mentality carries over into our spiritual lives and when we're praying for something when we're asking God for something rather than being patient we expect God to act now we want him to answer our prayers now the way that we want them to be answered and it just doesn't work that way with God God has a timing for everything and his timing is perfect and his understanding is complete and his wisdom is infallible and so we need to learn how to wait on the Lord in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 27 through 31 the children of Israel are in Babylonian captivity and they've been there for quite a while and they've been praying to God to deliver them from this they're getting weary and, and becoming discouraged because God hasn't got them out of this mess and so they begin to complain to God and Isaiah writes to them to comfort them and to encourage them to continue to wait on the Lord. In verse 27, Isaiah reproves God's people for their complaining and distrust in God. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, my cause disregarded by my God. The reason they were saying these things is because they were discouraged with God's answer. God had not answered their prayers the way they wanted him to. And so like little children, they were accusing God of not caring about them. When they said, my way is hidden from the Lord, they were basically saying, my life is not important to God. He's not interested in me. You ever felt that way? I mean, like, doesn't God see what I'm going through? Doesn't he know that I'm suffering and that I need him desperately right now to rescue me from the situation? I mean, why doesn't God give us what we ask for when we ask? I can remember once when my sister called me from the hospital she told me that her two-year-old daughter had fallen into the swimming pool and had drowned and they had resuscitated her and taken her to the hospital and they had put her on life support and would i please come to the hospital right away and when i got there the doctors came in and told my sister that her daughter would never recover from this that she was brain dead and asked my sister if she wanted to remove her from life support. And I can remember just crying out to God at that time and just praying, God, please, please, God, don't let this be so. Please let these doctors be wrong. God, please, please help her to overcome this. And work a miracle in her life god i know you have the power to do this please god don't let us suffer and nothing happened and she never recovered from it and i can tell you that i felt so frustrated and so disappointed with god that that he did not answer my prayer the way that i had asked him to I think that's exactly how the children of Israel were feeling. And so it's no wonder why they would complain and say, my cause is disregarded by my God. I mean, why is God just ignoring me? Why doesn't he answer my prayers? I keep crying out to him and calling for his help, and, and yet he just dismisses it. How can God stand by and let these things happen? Surely he sees our suffering and he knows how desperately we need his help. 
you know, it's feelings like that that push us to the edge, to the verge of just giving up and losing all hope. In verse 28, Isaiah asked them two rhetorical questions. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Of course they knew, and of course they had heard. From birth they were taught about their special relationship with God, how he had chosen the people of Israel to be his children, how he had delivered them out of bondage in Egypt and brought them to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey how he had fought their battles for them and provided for them and cared for them. They knew all about God. The problem wasn't that their way was hidden from the Lord. The problem was they had forgotten what they knew and had been taught all their lives about God. They had forgotten God's promises. God had promised the children of Israel in the days of Moses, never will I leave you or forsake you. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 8 says, The Lord himself goes before you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. God has promised to be with us forever, always. He's never far from us. In James 4, verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It's not that God is far away from us. It's that we are far away from God. We forget that he is close, that in him we live and move and have our being. God has promised that he will never give up on us either, that he will not abandon us, I think about all the stupid things that I do, and sometimes I wonder if God really puts up with it. But he's promised that he will never give up on us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Paul said, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he promised to be our helper. In Hebrews 4.16 it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Listen, God is always there for us. He provides everything that we need to be victorious. In Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. God provides us with wisdom and understanding. He gives us direction and strength and power so that we can succeed in life. He helps us with our temptations. In 1 Corinthians 10.13, it says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. God is our helper. And he works all things together for good. All things, not just the good things. He works even the bad things together for good. And not just when we know that he's with us or we feel his presence, but always, he's always working behind the scenes providentially on our behalf for our best. The Lord is our helper. Something else they knew and had been taught all their life but had forgotten is the character of God. In verse 28, it says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Whenever we're going through difficult times in our lives and lifting up prayers to God for help, we need to remind ourselves of God's promises. And secondly, we need to remind ourselves of who God is and rest in his character. 
He is the everlasting and almighty God. He has always been and will forever be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is infinite, eternal, limitless, boundless, immeasurable, not bound by time or space. And he is the all-powerful creator of the universe. He spoke all things into existence. He made the sun and the moon and the stars, the mountains and seas, the rocks, the hills and the plains. He created the fish and the birds of the air and the animals of the land. He made us. He is the everlasting and almighty God. And he is the enduring and ever-present God. He does not grow old or feeble. He doesn't need to take naps or rest because he's tired. He doesn't get weaker as time goes on like we do. And he never loses his wits. He knows all that goes on. Nothing startles him. He's not intimidated by anything. He doesn't forget things. He is completely in charge. And he is the all-knowing and all-wise God. He knows and understands all things. He knows everything there is to know about life. He knows every movement that takes place. He knows everything about us. He knows when we rise up and when we lie down, when we go out and when we come in. He even knows how many hairs we have on our heads. He knows everything. And all his works are perfect. Everything he does is right and true and just. He never has to redo anything or fix something he did wrong. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, it says, He is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. So when we're going through these really difficult times in our lives and we've been praying for God to intervene and we're discouraged with his answer and feeling like we're ready to give up, remind ourselves of God's promises. Remind ourselves of who God is and rest in his character. And finally, rely on God's strength. In Isaiah 40, 29 through 31, it says, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths get tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. He gives us inward strength. When we're mentally fatigued and we just are worn out from praying and asking God to help us and not really seeing any answers to our prayers, he gives us the willpower to keep trusting, to keep trying and not give up. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. He gives us upward strength. When we're spiritually drained and we begin to question our faith and doubt God, he gives us the faith to do all things. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can endure all hardship. I can bear up under any burden. I can overcome any trial. And I can do anything that God has called me to do. He gives us outward strength when we're physically exhausted and don't think we can do it any longer. He gives us the ability to abound in every good work. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 
And finally, he gives us onward strength. When we're ready to give up, when we're ready to throw in the towel, he renews our hope to continue on, that we might soar on wings like eagles and run and not grow weary and walk and not faint. Ephesians 6, 13 and 14 says, After you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Let me just say in closing that waiting on the Lord is more about trusting in the Lord than it is about his timing. The reality is that we might not get some things that we ask for. If they're not according to God's will, we won't. But we can be sure of this, that God always does what is right and best. And we can take great confidence in that. The psalmist said in Psalm 47, verses 13 and 14, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. May God bless you.